Hi all. I wanted to make a video to um, help reiterate or maybe clarify some of the concepts for epistasis and complementation. So first, epistasis, which I described to you as you see variations on the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 um, ratio, really involves two genes affecting one trait. Okay, so we're two genes affecting one trait. So we're only following one phenotype. The phenotype can have multiple um, variations, but this is different than a typical dihybrid cross where we're following two genes and two traits. Okay. What's the same is that both of these offspring come from a dihybrid cross. Right. That's the only way you can get this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio. But again, normally we're looking at dominant, 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 recessive, recessive, dominant, recessive, recessive, two traits. Okay. In epistasis, the A and the B genes are influencing one trait. Okay, so that's a big difference, and I'm not sure that I totally made that clear in class. So if we go back here, we talk about one gene masking or dominating over another gene. And again, this is different than alleles dominating right, like big A dominates over little a. Over here with epistasis, we're talking about genes dominating, and it's really not a good word, so I'd rather use masking another gene. Because if you remember, sometimes you can have the recessive alleles masking the other genes, right? So that's why I don't like to use this word dominating. So I'd like to cross this out. The gene is masking the effect of another gene. So two separate genes interacting somehow in a cell to give a phenotype. But the interaction of the genes can be different based on the genotype. Keep these words in mind. The epistatic gene is the one that masks, and the hypostatic gene is the one that is being masked. 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 Okay. All right, so let's look at possibilities. Right. So these are gene interactions that alter this ratio. I want you to understand that the inheritance of these alleles and genes are the same. They follow independent assortment. They follow the laws of segregation. It's just the interaction that gives a different phenotype for certain groups of genotypes. And the reason we emphasize the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, which is shown here, is because you can figure out which genes are epistatic, and maybe even figure out a little bit about how these genes interact in a biochemical pathway by looking at how the groups that you see are combinations of the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. So by knowing these what I call general genotypes, and remember the dash means could be, for instance, big A or little a. 
you don't know. Right? So we don't want to have to write out all the possibilities. Instead, we can use it as a shorthand to say that, well, here I know I have to have one of the big alleles, but the other allele for A doesn't matter. Could be the dominant, could be the recessive. And the same for B. And again, if you look across, here's all the possible genotypes. And if you look across this chart, oops, you can see that all we're doing to get these different ratios for epistasis is we're combining different groups from the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Again, if you know this, you can figure out any of these without having to memorize any of them. Um, Okay, so let's look at the three examples from the text. <clears throat> and this is because we worked on some pathways in recitation, and I want to try to explain a little bit about how you can figure these out. So something called recessive epistasis gives you a nine to three to three, sorry, a nine to three to four ratio. And this four is made up of a three and a one. So if we look at this, let me switch to my red here. We have three phenotypes, okay. which is different from a dihybrid normal cross, right, where 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 gives you four different phenotypes. So we have three phenotypes. And one of the phenotypes white right here is a combination of both the little a, little a, big B something that would normally give you three, and the little a, little a, little b, little b something that would normally give you one in your normal nine to three to three to one. But now, due to gene interaction, they show the same phenotype. And so what you want to look at is what is in, uh, or what is similar in these genotypes. And if you look at it, it's little a and little a. Okay. That is why it's called recessive epistasis, because the little a, little a is the epistatic gene. When you have little a, little a, doesn't matter which alleles you have for the B gene, you get this white phenotype. When you don't have little a, little a, and you have a dominant A allele, you get different phenotypes. So little a, little a is the epistatic gene, or um, I guess I should say epistatic alleles. So what does this mean as far as a biochemical pathway? So recessive epistasis tells you that the recessive allele masks the effect of another gene. Okay, In this case, it's this little a, little a that hides the B loci, or locus, sorry. And you only get expression of the alleles from the B locus if you have at least one dominant A allele. And again, just take some time and look at the information in the Punnett square to work through this. Now, as far as a uh, uh, whoops, pathway, what we have going on is that white fur color in mice is shown when you have little a, little a. So if there was a pathway going on here, little a, little a is going to block 
the pathway. So no matter what you have else going on, you're not going to get expression of those genes. Now when you don't have little a, little a, when you have at least one dominant a allele, the pathway continues. And if you look here, when you have a dominant A, okay, you get brown and you get black. But what's common in these is that all the browns have little b, little b. And all the blacks have both a dominant A and a dominant B. So the pathway goes that if you have a dominant A, you get brown. And on top of that, if you have a dominant B, you get black. So in order to get black, if you look at this backwards, you have to have at least one dominant B allele and at least one dominant A allele. And if you don't have a dominant B, you're going to be brown. And if you don't have a dominant A, in other words, if you have homozygous recessive A, you're going to have a white mouse. So that's how um, these pathways work. Let's look at dominant epistasis. Okay. Again, a variation on 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. In this case, the 12 represents the category of 9 and the category of 3. And so let's just look at genotypes compared to our numbers. So we know that the 1 is little a, little a, little b, little b, and it's green. And we know that one of the 3's, if we look at what's happening, they all have a capital A dominant, and they all have little b, little b, and that produces yellow squash. The 12, on the other hand, have the genotype either both dominant alleles or when you even have little a, little a, as long as you have a dominant B, you get the white coloring. So again, you're looking for what is common, and what is common here is the dominant B allele. That dominant B allele is masking the dominant A allele. You don't see the effects of the dominant A allele until you're homozygous recessive for B. And when you're homozygous recessive for both, you get a totally different phenotype that's green. So again, we have three phenotypes from dominant epistasis. And it's called ooh, dominant because it's a dominant allele that is masking the expression of other alleles. So what's happening here? Okay, I rewrote this one from class to make it match up with the um, Punnett square on the previous slide. And we basically, again, have three colors. We have white, we have yellow, and we have green. So if you have a capital B allele, that capital B blocks this pathway. Let's put it in red. Hope it good. Okay. So a dominant B allele blocks the pathway, and you don't go any further, you stay with white squash. If we look back at that Punnett square, if you have homozygous recessive B, you're going to be able to go along this pathway. And if you have at least one dominant A allele, you're going to get yellow squash. 
if you don't have a dominant A allele, so that the plant is homozygous recessive for both the A and the B gene, you get the green squash. So I keep it really simple. Um, remember, you're always looking for what's common and trying to figure out the pathway by what's common in these different phenotypes. Okay, one more that's called duplicate recessive, a 9 to 7. And what I want you to see is that when you have white flowers, what's common is that they are all homozygous recessive for the C or the P gene. So white is if you have little c, little c, or little p, little p. So that's why it's called duplicate recessive, because either recessive allele, homozygous, gives you the same phenotype. So this 7 is a combination of little a, little a, big B something, big A something, little b, little b, these are our 3's, and little a, little a, little b, little b, these are our 1's. So on the flip side, right, on the nines, that's where you have one of each dominant allele. And you can go through and check that out. As soon as you get homozygous recessive, you're going to have a different phenotype. So this is purple. Sorry if you can hear my phone. Worst thing about staying home is you get random calls all day long. So what does that mean biochemically? That means that one dominant allele, or let's put at least one dominant allele is required for the purple pigment. And that dominant allele could be A, oh no, I just said that wrong. Okay, erase. Both, sorry, both dominant alleles are required for purple pigment production. So the only way you get purple is if you have both A and both B. And so what this is trying to show you is if you block either pathway by having homozygous recessive, you're not going to get purple, you're going to get white. That's why this is all called, this is all, this is also called complementary epistasis. Because you need both of these in complement in, with each other in order to get the phenotype. Okay. But I'm not going to question you on what's the names of these epistatic uh, interactions. I'm going to ask you to explain it. So explain it based on dominant alleles or recessive alleles. Okay. So there's lots of types of epistasis. We saw that in that chart earlier. So if I gave you a ratio and I said, explain what's happening, how would you do it? Well, what you want to do is write out those general genotypes. Mm -hmm. 
memorize that. Crank out that nine to three to one ratio, nine to three to three to one ratio. Excuse me, and be able to match them up, right? And so we see here is where we're having something different going on, and we look at here, and in this case it's one recessive or the other that gives the phenotype, whatever it is. So any, oh uh, no, that's not what I want to say. If you have both dominant alleles, you get a different phenotype. So again, this one has three, and if you have both homozygous recessive, you get a third phenotype. So that's what I'm trying to see your analysis skills, um, all based on writing down these ratios. 15 and 1. The 15 represent, oops, represents any dominant allele gives you a specific phenotype. Right? So you can look at these numbers. Hold on, I'm writing myself a note for a good exam question I just thought of. Alright. Um, you could compare and contrast these. You could tell me what's the difference, right? Well, in here, any dominant allele gives you a specific phenotype. Here, both dominant alleles gives you a different phenotype than having <coughs> one dominant allele or the other. So that's another way to say this. One recessive or the other gives that phenotype or only one dominant allele gives a specific phenotype. Okay. And in both cases here, you've got the one, so homozygous recessive for both uh, genes gives you a separate phenotype. So again, don't get bogged down in the names. You can figure out whatever genes are epistatic based on using these um, alterations to the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. The other type of um, epistasis problem you would be given is to figure out what epistasis is, type of epistasis is happening. So that's where it says devise a genetic explanation for these results. So I want to know what's going on at the gene level. So let's write out what we know. The key to doing genetics problems is writing out, converting the story problems to kind of genetic shorthand. So you have a snapdragon plant that breeds true. As soon as you see this, you know it's homozygous. For white petals, so we have somebody white crossed with a plant that breeds true for purple. Okay, I don't know anything about their genotypes yet. That produces an F1 that has all white petals. When the F1 is selfed, you get the following progeny. Okay, here's the hint. The only way you can get variations on 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 is if you're doing a dihybrid cross. So I know in this case the F1 has to be heterozygous for both genes or else I wouldn't be able to determine a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. So I know these guys as genotypes. I don't know the parents yet. 
and I'll show you why. Okay, so now I kind of have um, what's going on a little bit, and now what I'm going to do is figure out my ratios. So I'm going to take the total offspring, and I'm going to divide by 16. Because remember that the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio is all about things being in groups of 1 16th. So when I add 240 plus 61 plus 19, I get 320. I divide that by 16 and I get 20. So 20 flowers or maybe plants is representing my 1 16th component. And I go back up here and I say, okay, how many times does 20 go into each of these numbers? Well, 240 divided by 20 is 12. And 60 divided by 20 is about 3. And 19 divided by 20 is about 1. So you always have to round so that this total is 16. So look, I've got a 12 to 3 to 1 ratio. So let's write that down. 12 to 3 to 1 ratio. So I know that in the 12, I have these genotypes. In the 3, I have this general genotype. And in the 1, I have this one. And looking at that chart, the 12 represents the white flowers, the 3 represents the purple, and the 1 represents spotted purple. So I have my ratios, and I have my genotypes of the F2. So what's happening? Well, I look at what's common and I say the A, dominant A allele, is epistatic and it produces white flowers. Right? So whenever I have dominant A, I get white flowers. If I don't have dominant A, then I can see purple or spotted. So if I see purple, that means I have at least one dominant B allele. And if I see spotted, I have homozygous recessive. Right? So if I was writing a pathway, I would say white is caused by the dominant A allele. You can't go any further. Oops, that one didn't work. To go to the next. Come on. Purple. I have to have the small a, small a, and I have to have the big B. And if I go to spotted purple, it's because I had the little b, little b. So the big B gives me purple, little b, little b gives me spotted purple. Now, this may not be the exact biochemical pathway, as far as how things are expressed. But what I'm interested in is you showing me your logic and can you figure out. Okay, so I'm not going to grade you on um, getting everything in order because as I told you in class, I struggle with this. So what I'm asking you is can you tell me how these different phenotypes are generated. Now, the one question we didn't answer is what are the genotypes for the parents? 
So let's look at the purple one first. So let's go back to the parents. So the parents we know have to be homozygous and we have a white parent and we have a purple parent. And from this we know that they have to produce a heterozygous dihybrid white plant. So what I think the easiest one to look at first is the purple parent because we know purple has to be little a, little a and big B, big B in this case because they were true breeding. The reason I did the purple first is because the white parent had two different possible genotypes. So I've already taken care of my big B allele and I've already taken care of my little a allele from this parent. Oh, oh, darn, 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 darn. Go back. Oh, I just turned off the screen. So, to get this white parent, I need a big A allele, and I need a little B allele. And I know they have to be homozygous because they're true breeding. So, that, or these, are the genotypes of the parents. Alright, I hope that helps a little with epistasis. I'm going to stop this recording and then you can click on the other link for complementation.